Act One of The Lady from the Sea by Hendrik Ibsen, translated by Eleanor Marx Arveling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Persons of the Drama Dr. Wangel, read by Bruce Peary. Elida Wangel, his second wife, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Bolette Wangel, his daughter by his first wife. Read by Ariel Lipshaw. Hilde Wangel, not yet grown up. His daughter by his first wife. Read by Lucy Perry. Arnholm, second master at a college. Read by Algie Pag. Lingstrand. Read by M. B. Ballestedt. Read by Pascal Ramsier. A stranger. Read by David Lawrence. Narrated by Avaii scene summer time at a small fjord town northern norway act one dr wangel's house with a large veranda left garden in front of and around the house under the veranda a flagstaff in the garden right an arbor with table and chairs hedge with small gate at the back Beyond, a road along the seashore, an avenue of trees along the road. Between the trees are seen the fjord, high mountain ranges and peaks. A warm and brilliantly clear summer morning. Ballestedt, middle-aged, wearing an old velvet jacket and a broad-brimmed artist's hat, stands under the flagstaff, arranging the ropes. The flag is lying on the ground. A little way from him an easel with an outspread canvas. By the easel on a camp stool, brushes, a palette, and box of colors. Bolette Wangel comes from the room opening on the veranda. She carries a large vase with flowers, which she puts down on the table. Well, Ballestead, does it work smoothly? Certainly, Miss Bolette. That's easy enough. May I ask, do you expect any visitors today? Yes, we're expecting Mr. Arnholm this morning. He got to town in the night. Arnholm? Wait a minute. Wasn't Arnholm the man who was tutor here several years ago? Yes, it is he. Oh, really? Is he coming into these parts again? That's why we want to have the flag up. Well, that's reasonable enough. Bolette goes into the room again. A little after, Lingstrand enters from the road right, and stands still, interested by the easel and painting gear. He is a slender youth, poorly but carefully dressed, and looks delicate. Lingstrand, on the other side of the hedge. Good morning. Ballestedt, turning round. Hello, good morning. Hoists up flag. That's it. Up goes the balloon. Fastens the ropes, and then busies himself about the easel. Good morning, my dear sir. I really don't think I have the pleasure of... I'm sure you're a painter. Of course I am. Why shouldn't I be? <laughs> yes, I, I can see you are. May I take the liberty of coming in a moment? Would you like to come in and see? I should like to immensely. Oh, there's nothing much to see yet, but come in. Come a little closer. Mm, many thanks. Comes in through the garden gate. Ballestedt, painting. It's the fjord there between the islands I'm working at. So I see. But the figure is still wanting. There's not a model to be got in this town. Oh, is there to be a figure too? Yes. Here by the rocks in the foreground, a mermaid is to lie. Half dead. Well, why is she to be half dead? She has wandered hither from the sea and can't find her way out again. And so, you see, she lies there dying in breakish water. Ah, I see. The mistress of this house put it into my head to do something of the kind. What shall you call the picture when it's finished? I think of calling it The Mermaid's End. Oh, that's capital. You're sure to make something fine of it. Ballestedt, looking at him. In the profession too, perhaps? You mean a painter? Yes. No, I'm not that. Uh, but I'm going to be a sculptor. My name is Hans Lingstrand. So you are to be a sculptor? Yes, yes. The art of sculpture is a nice pretty art in its way. I fancy I've seen you in the street once or twice. Have you been staying here long? No, I've only been here a fortnight. But I shall try to stop till the end of the summer. 
For the bathing? Yes. I wanted to see if I could get a little stronger. Not delicate, surely? Yes, perhaps I am a little delicate, but it's nothing dangerous, just a little tightness in the chest. Tush, a bagatelle. You should consult a good doctor. Yes, I, I thought of speaking to Dr. Vango one of these times. You should. Looks out left. There's another steamer, crowded with passengers. It's really marvelous how traveling has increased here of late years. Yes, um, there's a good deal of traffic here, I think. And lots of summer visitors come here, too. I often hear a good town will lose its individuality with all these foreign going-ons. Were you born in the town? No, but I have accla acclimatized myself. I feel united to the place by the bonds of time and habit. Then you've lived here a long time? Well, about 17 or 18 years. I came here with Skype's dramatic company. But then we got into difficulties, and so the company broke up and dispersed in all directions. But you yourself remained here? I remained, and I've done very well. I was then working chiefly as a decorative artist, don't you know? Boletta comes out with a rocking chair, which she places on the veranda. Boletta speaking into the room. Hilda, see if you can find the embroidered footstool for father. Linkstrand, going up to the veranda, bows. Good morning, Miss Vango. Bolette, by the balustrade. What? Is it you, Mr. Lingstrand? Good morning. Excuse me one moment. I'm only... Goes into room. Do you know the family? Oh, not well. I've, I've only met the young ladies now and again in company. And uh, I had a chat with Mrs. Vango the last time we had music up at The View. She said I might come and see them. Now, do you know? You ought to cultivate their acquaintance. Yes. I, I'd been thinking of paying a visit, just a sort of call. If only I could find some excuse. Excuse, nonsense. Looking out left. Damn it. Gathering his things. The steamer's by the pier already. I must get off to the hotel. Perhaps some of the new arrivals may want me. For I'm a hairdresser too, don't you know? You are certainly very many-sided, sir. In small towns, one has to try to... Accl acclimatize oneself in various branches. If you should require anything in the hairline, a little pomaton or such like, you've only to ask for Dancing Master Ballisted. Dancing Master? President of the Wind Band Society, by your leave. We've a concert on this evening up at the view. Goodbye. Goodbye. He goes out with his painting gear through the garden gate and off left. Hilda comes out with the footstool. Bolette brings more flowers. Linkstrand bows to Hilda from the garden below. Hilda, by the balustrade, not returning his bow. Bolette said you had ventured in today. Yes, I took the liberty of coming in for a moment. Have you been out for a morning walk? Oh, no. Nothing came of the walk this morning. Have you been bathing, then? Yes, I've been down in the water a little while. I saw your mother down there. She was going into her bathing machine. Who was? Your mother. Oh, I see. She puts the stool in front of the rocking chair. Bolette, interrupting. Didn't you see anything of father's boat out on the fjord? Yes, I thought I saw a sailing boat that was steering inland. I'm sure that was father. He's been to visit patients on the islands. She is arranging things on the table. Lingstrand taking a step up the stairs to the veranda. Why, how everything's decorated here with flowers! Yes, doesn't it look nice? It looks lovely. It looks as if it were some festival day in the house. That's exactly what it is. I might have guessed it. I'm sure it's your father's birthday. Boletta, warningly to Hilda. Hmm. Hmm. Hilda, taking no notice of her. No, mother's. Oh, your mother's. Really, Hilda? Let me be. To Linkstrand. I suppose you're going home to breakfast now. Linkstrand, going down steps. Yes, I suppose I must go and get something to eat, huh? I'm sure you find the living very good at the hotel. I'm not staying at the hotel now. It was too expensive for me. Where are you staying, then? I'm staying up at Mrs. Jensen's. What Mrs. Jensen's? The midwife. Excuse me, Mr. Lingstrand, but I really have other matters to attend to. Oh, I'm sure I ought not to have said that. Said what? What I said. Hilda, looking contemptuously at him. I don't understand you in the least. 
Oh, no, no. But I, I must say good-bye for the present. Bolette comes forward to the steps. Good-bye. Good-bye, Mr. Lingstrand. You must excuse us now. But another day, when you've plenty of time, and inclination, you really must come in and see father and the rest of us. Yes. Thanks very much. I shall be delighted. Bows and goes out through the garden gate. As he goes along the road left, he bows again towards the veranda. Adieu, monsieur. Please remember me to Mother Jensen. Bolette, shaking her arm. Hilda, you naughty child. Are you quite crazy? He might have heard you. Shh. Do you think I care about that? Bolette, looking out right. Here's father. Bungle, in travelling dress and carrying a small bag, comes from the footpath right. See, I'm back again, little girls. He enters through the garden gate. Bolette, going towards him at the bottom of the garden. Oh, it is delightful that you've come. Hilda, also going up to him. Now have you got off for the whole day, father? Oh, no, I must go down to the office for a little while presently. I say, do you know if Arnholm has come? Yes, he arrived in the night. We sent to the hotel to inquire. Then you've not seen him yet? No, but he's sure to come here this morning. Yes, he's sure to do that. Hilda, pulling him. Father, now you must look round. Wangel, looking towards the veranda. Yes, I see well enough, child. It's quite festive. Now don't you think we've arranged it nicely? I must say you have. Are, are we alone at home now? Yes, she's gone to... Mother has gone to bathe. Wangel looks lovingly at Polette and pats her head. Then he says, hesitating, Look here, little ones. Do you want to keep this up all day? And the flag hoisted, too? Surely you understand that, father. Mm. Yes. But you see... Bolette looks at him and nods. Surely you can understand we've been doing all this in honour of Mr. Arnholm, when such a good friend comes to see you for the first time. Hilda, smiling and shaking him. Think. He who used to be Bolette's tutor, father. Wangel, with a half-smile. You're a pair of slime minxes. Well, good heavens, after all, it's but natural we should remember her who is no more with us. Here, Hilda. Gives her his bag. Take that down to the office. No, children, I don't like this. The way, I mean. This habit of every year. Well, what can one say? I suppose it can't be managed any other way. Hilda, about to go out of garden, and, with the bag, stops short, turns, and points out. Look at that gentleman coming up here. I'm sure it's your tutor. Bolette looks in that direction. He? <laughs> that is good. Do you think that middle-aged fellow is Arnholm? Wait a moment, child. Why, by Jove, I do believe it is he. Yes, it certainly is. Bolette, staring at him in quiet amazement. Yes. I almost think. Arnholm, in elegant morning dress with gold spectacles and a thin cane, comes along the road left. He looks overworked. He looks in at the garden, bows in friendly fashion, and enters by the garden gate. Wangel, going to meet him. Welcome, dear Arnholm. Heartily welcome back to your old quarters again. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Wangel. A thousand thanks. They shake hands and walk up the garden together. And there are the children. Holds out his hands and looks at them. I should hardly have known these two again. No, I believe you. And yet, perhaps Bolette. Yes, I should have known Bolette again. Hardly, I think. Why, it is eight, nine years since you saw her. Ah, yes, many a thing has changed here, meanwhile. Arnholm, looking round. I really don't see it except that the trees have grown remarkably, and that you've set up that arbour. Oh, no, outwardly. Arnholm, smiling. And then, of course, you've two grown-up daughters here now. Grown-up? Well, there's only one grown-up. Hilda, aside. Just listen to father. But now let's sit down up there on the veranda. It's cooler than here. Won't you? Thanks. Thanks, dear doctor. They go up. Wangel motions him to the rocking chair. 
that's right now make yourself comfortable and rest for you seem rather tired after your journey oh that's nothing here amid these surroundings bolette to vangel hadn't we better have some soda and syrup in the sitting-room it's sure to be too hot out here soon yes girls let's have some soda and syrup and perhaps a drop of cognac too cognac too just a little in case anyone should like some all right hilda go down to the office with the bag bolette goes into the room and closes the door after her hilda takes the bag and goes through the garden to the back of the house left arnholm who has followed bolette with his eyes what a splendid there are both splendid girls who've grown up here for you wangel sitting down yes you think so too why it's simply amazing our bolette and hilda too but now you yourself dear doctor do you think of staying here all your life yes i suppose so why i've been born and bred here so to say i lived here so very happily with her who left us so early she whom you knew when you were here before arnholm yes yes and now i live here so happily with her who has taken her place ah on the whole fate has been very good to me you have no children by your second marriage we had a little boy two two and a half years ago but he didn't stay long he died when he was four or five months old isn't your wife at home to-day oh yes she's sure to be here soon she's down there bathing she does so every blessed day no matter what the weather is she ill then not exactly ill although she has been extremely nervous for the last few years that is to say she is now and then i can't make out what really ails her but to plunge into the sea is her joy and delight yes i remember that of old wangel with an almost imperceptible smile to be sure you knew alida when you were teacher out there at skjoldviken certainly she used often to visit the parsonage but i mostly met her when i went to the lighthouse to see her father those times out there you may believe me have set deep marks upon her the people in town here can't understand her at all they call her the lady from the sea do they yes and so now you see speak to her of the old days dear arnholm it will do her good arnholm looks at him in doubt have you any reason for thinking so assuredly i have elida her voice is heard outside the garden right are you there wangel wangel rising yes dear mrs elida wangel in a large light wrap and with wet hair hanging loose over her shoulders comes from between the trees of the arbor arnholm rises wangel smiling and holding out his hands to her ah so now we have our mermaid elida goes quickly up the veranda and seizes his hands oh, thank god that i see you again when did you come just now a little while since pointing to arnholm but won't you greet an old acquaintance elida holding out her hand to arnholm so here you are welcome and forgive me for not being at home don't mention it don't stand on any ceremony was the water nice and fresh to-day fresh Ugh, the water here is never fresh. It is so tepid and lifeless. Ugh, the water in the fjord here is sick. Sick? Yes, sick. And I believe it makes one sick, too. Wangel, smiling. You're giving our bathing resort a good name. I should rather believe, Mrs. Wangel, that you have a peculiar relation to the sea, and to all that belongs to it. Perhaps. I almost think so myself. But do you see how festively the girls have arranged everything in your honour? Hmm. Looks at his watch. Well, I suppose I must be quick, and— Is it really for me? Yes, you may be sure we don't decorate like this every day. Ugh! How suffocatingly hot it is under this roof. Goes down into garden. Come over here. Here at least there is a little air. Sits down in arbour. Arnholm going thither. I think the air quite fresh here. Yes, you, who are used to the stifling air of the town. It's terrible there in the summer, I hear. Wangel, who has also gone into the garden. Mm, dear Elida, you must just entertain our friend alone for a little while. Are you busy? 
yes i must go down to the office and then i must change but i won't be long arnholm sitting down in arbour now don't hurry dear doctor your wife and i will manage to kill the time wangel nodding oh yes i'm sure you will well good-bye for the present he goes out through the garden elida after a short pause don't you think it's pleasant sitting out here i think i've a pleasant seat now they call this my arbour because i had it fitted up or rather wangel did it for me and you usually sit here yes i pass most of the day here with the girls i suppose no the girls usually sit on the veranda and wangel himself oh wangel goes to and fro now he comes to me and then he goes to his children and is it you who wish this i think all parties feel most comfortable in this way you know we can talk across to one another if we happen to find there is anything to say arnholm after thinking a while when i last crossed your path out at school viken i mean <clears throat> uh, that is long ago now it's quite ten years since you were there with us yes about that but when i think of you out there in the lighthouse the heathen as the old clergyman called you because your father had named you as he said after an old ship and hadn't given you a name fit for a christian well what then the last thing that i should then have believed was that i should see you again down here as the wife of wangel no at that time wangel wasn't at that time the girl's first mother was still living their real mother so of course of course but even if that had not been even if he had been free still i could never have believed this would come about nor i never on earth then wangel is such a good fellow so honourable so thoroughly good and kind to all men yes he is indeed but he must be so absolutely different from you i fancy you are right there so he is well but how did it happen how did it come about oh dear arnholm you mustn't ask me about that i couldn't explain it to you and even if i could you would never be able to understand in the least Hmm. Have you ever confided anything about me to your husband? Of course, I mean about the useless step uh, I allowed myself to be moved to. No, you may be sure of that. I've not said a word to him about—about about what you speak of. I am glad. I felt rather awkward at the thought that— There was no need. I have only told him what is true, that I liked you very much, and that you were the truest and best friend I had out there thanks for that but tell me why did you never write to me after i had gone away i thought that perhaps it would pain you to hear from one who who could not respond as you desired it seemed like reopening a painful subject mm. yes yes perhaps you were right but why didn't you write looks at her and smiles half reproachfully i make the first advance perhaps expose myself to the suspicion of wanting to begin all over again after such a repulse as i had had oh no i understand very well have you never since thought of forming any other tie never i have been faithful to my first memories <laughs> nonsense let the sad old memories alone you'd better think of becoming a happy husband i should say i should have to be quick about it then mrs wangel remember i'm I'm ashamed to say I'm past thirty-seven. Well, all the more reason for being quick. She's silent for a moment, and then says earnestly in a low voice, But listen, dear Arnholm, now I am going to tell you something that I could have not told you then, to save my life. What is it? When you took the, the useless step you were just speaking of, I could not answer you otherwise than I did. I know that you had nothing but friendship to give me. I know that well enough. But you did not know that all my mind and soul were then given elsewhere. At that time? Yes. But it is impossible. You are mistaken about the time. I hardly think you knew Wangel then. It is not Wangel of whom I speak. Not Wangel? But at that time, out there at school, we can... I can't remember a single person whom I can imagine a possibility of your caring for no no i quite believe that for it was all such bewildering madness 
all of it. But tell me more of this. Oh, it's enough if you know that I was bound then. And you know it now. And if you had not been bound? Well? Would your answer to my letter have been different? How can I tell? When Vongel came, the answer was different. What is your object, then, in telling me that you were bound? Elida getting up, as if in fear and unrest. Because I must have some one in whom to confide. No, no, sit still. Then your husband knows nothing about this? I confessed to him from the first that my thoughts had once been elsewhere. He never asked to know more, and we have never touched upon it since. Besides, at bottom it was simply madness. And then it was over directly. That is, to a certain extent. Arnholm, rising. Only to a certain extent? Not quite? Yes, yes, it is. Oh, good heavens, dear Arnholm, it is not what you think. It is something so absolutely incomprehensible. I don't know how I could tell it to you. You would only think I was ill, or quite mad. My dearest lady, now you really must tell me all about it. Well, then, I'll try to. How will you, as a sensible man, explain to yourself that— Looks round and breaks off. Wait a moment. Here's a visitor. Lingstrand comes along the road left and enters the garden. He has a flower in his buttonhole and carries a large, handsome bouquet done up in paper and silk ribbons. He stands somewhat hesitatingly and undecidedly by the veranda. Elida, from the arbor. Have you come to see the girls, Mr. Lingstrand? Lingstrand, turning round. Ah, madam, are you there? Bows and comes nearer. No, it's not that. It's not the young ladies. It's you yourself, Mrs. Vongel. You know, you gave me permission to come and see you. And... Of course I did. You are always welcome here. Oh, thanks. And as it falls out so luckily that it's a festival here today. Oh, do you know about that? Rather. And so I should like to take the liberty of presenting this to Mrs. Vongel. Bows and offers her bouquet. Elida, smiling. But, my dear Mr. Lingstrand, oughtn't you to give these lovely flowers to Mr. Arnholm himself? For you know it's really he. Lingstrand, looking uncertainly at both of them. Excuse me, but I, I don't know this gentleman. It's only, I've only come about the birthday, Mrs. Vongel. Birthday? You've made a mistake, Mr. Lingstrand. There's no birthday here today. Lingstrand, smiling slyly. Oh, I know all about that. But I didn't think it was to be kept so dark. What do you know? That it is Madame's birthday. Mine? Arnholm looks questioningly at her. Today? Surely not. Elida to Lingstrand. Whatever made you think that? It was Miss Hilda who let it out. I just looked in here a little while ago, and I asked the young ladies why they were decorating the place like this, with flowers and flags. Well? And so Miss Hilda said, why, today is Mother's birthday. Mother's. I see. Aha! He and Elida exchange a meaning look. Well, now that the young man knows about it. Elida to Lingstrand. Well, now that you know. Lingstrand offering her the bouquet again. <laughs> May I take the liberty of congratulating you? Elida taking the flowers. <laughs> My best thanks. Won't you sit down a moment, Mr. Lingstrand? Elida, Arnholm, and Lingstrand sit down in the arbor. This birthday business was to have been kept secret, Mr. Arnholm. So I see. It wasn't for us uninitiated folk. Elida putting down the bouquet. Just so. Not for the uninitiated. Upon my word, I, I won't tell a living soul about it. Oh, it wasn't meant like that. But how are you getting on? I think you look better than you did. Oh, I think I'm getting on famously. And by next year, if I can go south— And you are going south, the girls tell me. Yes, for I have a benefactor and friend at Bergen who looks after me and has promised to help me next year. How did you get such a friend? Well, it all happened so very luckily. I, I once went to sea in one of his ships. Did you? So you wanted to go to sea? Well, no, not at all. But when Mother died, Father wouldn't have me knocking about at home any longer, and so he sent me to sea. Then we were wrecked in the English Channel on our way home, and that was very fortunate for me. What do you mean? Yes, for it was in the shipwreck that I got this little weakness of, of my chest. I was so long in the ice-cold water before they picked me up. 
and so i had to give up the sea yes that was very fortunate indeed do you think so well, yes for the weakness isn't dangerous and now i can be a sculptor as i so dearly want to be just think to model in that delicious clay that yields so caressingly to your fingers and what are you going to model is it to be mermen and mermaids or is it to be old vikings no not that as soon as i can set about it i'm going to try if i can produce a great work a, a group as they call it yes but what's the group to be oh something i've experienced myself yes yes always stick to that but what's it to be uh well i thought it should be the young wife of a sailor who uh, lies sleeping in strange unrest and she's dreaming i, I fancy i shall do it so that you, you will see she's dreaming is there anything else yes there's to be another figure a, a sort of apparition as they say it's her husband to whom she has been faithless while he was away and he is drowned at sea what drowned yes yes he was drowned on a sea voyage but that's the wonderful part of it he comes home all the same it is night time and he is standing by her bed looking at her he is to stand there dripping wet like one drawn from the sea elida leaning back in her chair what an extraordinary idea shutting her eyes oh i can see it so clearly living before me but how on earth mr mr i thought you said it was to be something you had experienced yes i, I did experience that well that is to say to a certain extent you saw a dead man well well i don't mean i've actually seen this experienced it in the flesh but still oh tell me all you can about it i must understand about all this arnholm smiling yes that'll be quite in your line something that has to do with sea fancies what was it mr lingstrand well uh, it was like this at the time when we were to sail home in the brig from a town they called halifax we had to leave the boatswain behind in the hospital so we had to engage an american instead this new boatswain the american yes well one day he got the captain to lend him a lot of old newspapers and he was always reading them for uh, he wanted to teach himself norwegian he said well and then it was one evening in rough weather all hands were on deck except the boatswain and myself for he had sprained his foot and couldn't walk and i was feeling rather low and was lying in my berth well uh, he was sitting there in the forecastle reading one of those old papers again well well but just as he was sitting there quietly reading i heard him utter a sort of yell and when i looked at him i saw his face was white as chalk and then he began to crush and crumple the paper and to tear it into a thousand shreds but he did it so quietly quietly didn't he say anything didn't he speak not directly but a little after he said to himself as it were married to another man while i was away elida closes her eyes and says half to herself he said that yes and think he said it in perfect norwegian that man must have learnt foreign languages very easily and what then what else happened well now the remarkable part is coming that i shall never forget as long as i live for he added and that quite quietly too but she is mine and mine she shall remain and she shall follow me if i should come home and fetch her as a drowned man from the dark sea elida pouring herself out a glass of water her hand trembles oh how close it is here to-day and he said this with such strength of will that i thought he must be the man to do it don't you know anything about what became of the man oh madam he's certainly not living now why do you think that why be because we were shipwrecked afterwards in the channel i had got into the longboat with the captain and five others and the mate got into the stern boat and the american was in that too and another man and nothing has been heard of them since not a word the friend who looks after me said so quite recently in a letter but it's just because of this i was so anxious to make it into a work of art i see the faithless sailor wife so lifelike before me and the avenger who is drowned and who nevertheless comes home from the sea i i can see them both so distinctly i too rises 
come, let us go in, or rather go down to Vongel. I think it is so suffocatingly hot. She goes out of the arbor. Lingstrand, who has also risen. I, for my part, must ask you to excuse me. This was only to be a short visit because of the birthday. As you wish. Holds out her hand to him. Good-bye, and thank you for the flowers. Lingstrand bows and goes off through the garden gate. Arnholm rises and goes up to Elida. I see well enough that this has gone to your heart, Mrs. Wangel. Yes, you may well say so. Although— But still, after all, it's no more than you are bound to expect. Elida looks at him surprised. Expect? Well, so it seems to me. Expect that any one should come back again, come to life again like that. But what on earth? Is that the mad sculptor's sea story, then? Oh, dear Arnholm, perhaps it isn't so mad after all. Is it that nonsense about the dead man that has moved you, sir? And I who thought that— What did you think? I naturally thought that was only a make-believe of yours, and that you were sitting here grieving because you had found out a family feast was being kept secret, because your husband and his children live a life of remembrances in which you have no part. Oh, no, no! That may be as it may. I have no right to claim my husband wholly and solely for myself. I should say you had. Yes. Yet all the same I have not. That is it. Why, I too live in something from which they are shut out. You? Do you mean you—you you do not really love your husband? Oh, yes, yes, I have learned to love him with all my heart. And that's why it is so terrible so inexplicable, so absolutely inconceivable. Now you must and shall confide all your troubles to me, will you, Mrs. Wangel? I cannot, dear friend. Not now, in any case. Later, perhaps. Boletta comes out into the veranda and goes down into the garden. Father's coming up from the office. Hadn't we better all of us go into the sitting-room? Yes, let us. Wangel, in other clothes, comes with Hilda from behind the house, left. Now then, here I am at your service, and now we shall enjoy a good glass of something cool. Wait a moment. She goes into the arbor and fetches the bouquet. I say, all those lovely flowers. Where did you get them? From the sculptor, Lingstrand, my dear Hilda. Hilda starts. From Lingstrand? Boletta, uneasily. Has Lingstrand been here again? Elida with a half-smile. Yes. He came here with these. Because of the birthday, you understand? Boletta looks at Hilda. Oh, the idiot! Wangel in painful confusion to Elida. Mm, yes, well, you see, I must tell you, my dear, good, beloved Elida. Come, girls, let us go and put my flowers in the water together with the others. Goes up to the veranda. Boletta to Hilda. Oh, after all, she is good at heart. Hilda in a low tone with angry look. Fiddlesticks! She only does it to take in father. Wangel on the veranda presses Elida's hand. Thanks, thanks. My heart felt thanks for that, dear Elida. Elida arranging the flowers. Nonsense! Should not I too be in it and take part in, in mother's birthday? Hmm. He goes up to Wangel, and Elida, Bolette, and Hilde remain in the garden below. End of Act One Act Two of The Lady from the Sea by Henrik Ibsen Translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two At The View, a shrub-covered hill behind the town. A little in the background a beacon and a vane. Great stones arranged as seats around the beacon and in the foreground. Farther back is seen the outer fjord, with islands and outstanding headlands. The open sea is not visible. It is a summer's evening and twilight. A golden-red shimmer in the air and over the mountain tops in the far distance. 
a quartet is faintly heard singing below in the background right young townsfolk ladies and gentlemen come up in pairs from the right and talking familiarly pass out beyond the beacon left a little after ballestead enters as guide to a party of foreign tourists with their ladies he is laden with shawls and travelling bags ballestead pointing upwards with a stick sehen sie meine herrschaften dort auf der liegt eine andere mountain das wollen wir also besteigen und so herunter he goes on with the conversation in french and leads the party off left Hilde comes quickly along the uphill path right, stands still, and looks back. Soon after, Bolette comes up the same way. But, dear, why should we run away from Lingstrand? Because I can't bear going uphill so slowly. Look, look at him crawling up. Ah, but you know how delicate he is. Do you think it's very dangerous? I certainly do. He went to consult father this afternoon. I should like to know what father thinks about him. Father told me it was a thickening of the lungs or something of the sort. He won't live to be old, Father says. No. Did he say it? Fancy. That's exactly what I thought. For heaven's sake, don't show it. How can you imagine such a thing? Look, here comes Hans crawling up. Don't you think you can see by the look of him that he's called Hans? Now do behave. You'd better. Lingstrand comes in from the right, a parasol in his hand. I uh, must beg the young ladies to excuse me for not getting along as quickly as they did. Have you got a parasol too now? It's your mother's. She said I was to use it as a stick. I hadn't mine with me. Are they down there still, father and the others? Yes, uh, your father looked in at the restaurant for a moment, and the others are sitting out there listening to the music. But uh, they were coming up here presently, your, your mother said. Hilda stands looking at him. I suppose you're thoroughly tired out now. Yes, I almost think I'm a little tired now. I uh, really believe I shall have to sit down a moment. He sits on one of the stones in the foreground right. Hilda, standing in front of him. Do you know there's to be dancing down there on the parade? Yes, I, I heard there was some talk about it. I suppose you think dancing's great fun. Bolette, who begins gathering small flowers among the heather. Oh, Hilda! Now do let Mr. Lingstrand get his breath. Lingstrand to Hilde. Yes, Miss Hilde, I should very much like to dance, if only I could. Oh, I see. Haven't you ever learnt? <laughs> no, I, I've not. But it wasn't that I meant. I, I meant I couldn't because of my chest. Because of that weakness you said you suffered from? Yes, because of that. Aren't you very sorry that you've that weakness? Oh, no, I can't say I am, for... Smiling. I think it's because of that everyone is so good and friendly and kind to me, you know? Yes, and then besides, it's not dangerous. No, it's not at all dangerous. So I gathered from what your father said to me. And then it will pass away as soon as you ever begin travelling. Of course it will pass away. Bolette with flowers. Look here, Mr. Lingstrand, you are to put this in your buttonhole. Oh, a thousand thanks, Miss Vangel. It's really too good of you. Hilda, looking down path right. There they are, coming along the road. Bolette, also looking down. If only they knew where to turn off. No, now they're going wrong. Lingstrand, rising. I I'll run down to the turning and call out to them. You'll have to call out pretty loud. No, it's not worth while. You'll only tire yourself again. Oh, it's so easy going downhill. <laughs> goes off right downhill yes looking after him why he's actually jumping and he never remembers he'll have to come up again poor fellow if lingstrand were to propose would you accept him are you quite mad of course i mean if you weren't troubled with that weakness and if you weren't to die so soon would you have him then i think you'd better have him yourself no that i wouldn't why he hasn't a farthing he hasn't enough even to keep himself. Then why are you always going about with him? Oh, I only do that because of the weakness. I've never noticed that you in the least pity him for it. No, I don't. But I think it is so interesting. What is? To look at him and make him tell you that it isn't dangerous and that he's going abroad and is to be an artist. 
He really believes it all, and is so thoroughly happy about it. And yet nothing will ever come of it, nothing whatever. For he won't live long enough. I feel that's so fascinating to think of. Fascinating? Yes, I think it is most fascinating. I take that liberty. Hilda, you really are a dreadful child. That's just what I want to be. Out of spite. Looking down. At last. I shouldn't think Arnholm liked coming uphill. Turns round. By the way, do you know what I noticed about Arnholm at dinner? Well? Just think. His hair's beginning to come off. Right on the top of his head. Nonsense. I'm sure that's not true. It is. And then he has wrinkles round both his eyes. Good gracious, Boletta. How could you be so much in love with him when he used to read with you? Boletta, smiling. Yes, can you believe it? I remember I once shed bitter tears because he thought Boletta was an ugly name. Only to think. Looking down. No, I say, do just look down here. There's the mermaid walking along and chatting with him. Not with father. I wonder if those two aren't making eyes at one another. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. How can you stand there and say such a thing of her? Now, when everything was beginning to be so pleasant between us. Of course. Just try and persuade yourself of that, my child. Oh, no, it will never be pleasant between us and her. For she doesn't belong to us at all. And we don't belong to her either. Goodness knows what father dragged her into the house for. I shouldn't wonder if some fine day she went mad under our very eyes. Mad? How can you think such a thing? Oh, it wouldn't be so extraordinary. Her mother went mad, too. She died mad. I know that. Yes, heaven only knows what you don't poke your nose into. But now don't go chattering about this. Do be good, for father's sake. Do you hear, Hilda? Wangel, Elida, Arnholm, and Linkstrand come up from the right. Elida, pointing to background. Out there it lies. Quite right. It must be in that direction. Out there is the sea. Boletta to Arnholm. Don't you think it is delightful up here? It's magnificent, I think. Glorious view. I suppose you never used to come up here. No, never. In my time I used to think it was hardly accessible. There wasn't any path, even. And no grounds. All this has been done during the last few years. And there at the pilot's mount. It's even grander than here. Shall we go there, Elida? Elida, sitting down on one of the stones, right. Thanks, not I. But you others can. I'll sit here meanwhile. Then I'll stay with you. The girls can show Arnholm about. Would you like to go with us, Mr. Arnholm? I should like to very much. Does a path lead up there, too? Oh, yes. There's a nice broad path. The path is so broad that two people can walk along it comfortably arm in arm. Arnholm, jestingly. Is that really so, little missy? To Boletta. Shall we two see if she is right? Boletta, suppressing a smile. Very well. Let's go. They go out left, arm in arm. Hilde to Linkstrand. Shall we go, too? Arm in arm? Oh, why not? For aught I care. Linkstrand taking her arm, laughing contentedly. <laughs> this is a jolly lark. Lark? Well, oh, yes, because it looks exactly as if we were engaged. I'm sure you've never walked arm in arm with a lady before, Mr. Lingstrand. They go off left. Wangel, who is standing beside the beacon. Dear Elida, now we have a moment to ourselves. Yes. Come and sit down here by me. Wangel, sitting down. It is so free and quiet. Now we can have a little talk together. What about? About yourself, and then about us both. Elida, I see very well that it can't go on like this. What do you propose instead? Perfect confidence, dear. A true life together, as before. Oh, if that could be. But it is so absolutely impossible. I think I understand you from certain things you have let fall now and again. Oh, you do not. Don't say you understand. Yes. Yours is an honest nature, Elida. Yours is a faithful mind. It is. Any position in which you could feel safe and happy must be a completely true and real one. Elida, looking eagerly at him. Well, and then? You are not suited to be a man's second wife. What makes you think that? It has often flashed across me like a foreboding. 
Today it was clear to me. The children's memorial feast. You saw in me a kind of accomplice. Well, yes, a man's memories, after all, cannot be wiped out. Not so mine, anyhow. It isn't in me. I know that. Oh, I know that so well. But you are mistaken all the same. To you it is almost as if the children's mother were still living, as if she were still here, invisible amongst us. You think my heart is equally divided between you and her. It is this thought that shocks you. You see something immoral in our relation, and that is why you no longer can or will live with me as my wife. Elida, rising. Have you seen all that, Vongel? Seen into all this? Yes. Today I have at last seen to the very heart of it, to its utmost depths. To its very heart, you say? Oh, do not think that. Vangel rising i see very well that there is more than this dear alida you know there is more yes you cannot bear your surroundings here the mountains crush you and weigh upon your heart nothing is open enough for you here the heavens above you are not spacious enough the air is not strong and bracing enough you are right night and day winter and summer it weighs upon me this irresistible homesickness for the sea i know it well dear alida laying his hands upon her head and that is why the poor sick child shall go home to her own again what do you mean something quite simple we are going away going away yes somewhere by the open sea a place where you can find a true home after your own heart oh dear do not think of that that is quite impossible you can live happily nowhere on earth but here that must be as it may and besides do you think i can live happily here without you but i am here and i will stay here you have me have i alida oh don't speak of all this why here you have all that you love and strive for all your life's work lies here that must be as it may i tell you we are going away from here are going somewhere out there that is quite settled now dear alida what do you think we should gain by that you would regain your health and peace of mind hardly and then you yourself think of yourself too what of you i would win you back again my dearest but you cannot do that no no you can't do that vongel that is the terrible part of it heart-breaking to think of that remains to be proved if you are harboring such thoughts truly there is no other salvation for you than to go hence and the sooner the better now this is irrevocably settled do you hear no <sighs> then in heaven's name i had better tell you everything straight out everything just as it is yes yes do for you shall not ruin your happiness for my sake especially as it can't help us in any way i have your word now that you will tell me everything just as it is i'll tell you everything as well as i can and as far as i understand it come here and sit by me they sit down on the stones well alida so that day when you came out there and asked me if i would be yours you spoke so frankly and honestly to me about your first marriage. It had been so happy, you said. And so it was. Yes. Yes, I am sure of that, dear. It is not for that I am referring to it now. I only want to remind you that I, on my side, was frank with you. I told you quite openly that once in my life I had cared for another, that there had been a, a kind of engagement between us. A kind of— Yes something of the sort well it only lasted such a very short time he went away and after that i put an end to it i told you all that why rake up all this now it really didn't concern me nor have i once asked you who he was no you have not you are always so thoughtful for me oh in this case i could guess the name well enough for myself the name out in skjoldviken and thereabouts there weren't many to choose from 
or rather there was only a single one you believe it was arnholm well wasn't it no not he then i don't in the least understand can you remember that late in the autumn a large american ship once put into skjoldviken for repairs yes i remember it very well it was on board that ship that the captain was found one morning in his cabin murdered i myself went out to make the post-mortem yes it was you it was the second mate who had murdered him no one can say that for it was never proved there was enough against him anyhow or why should he have drowned himself as he did he did not drown himself he sailed in a ship to the north how do you know well wangel it was to this second mate to whom i was betrothed wangel springing up what is it possible yes it is so it was to him but how on earth elida how did you come to betroth yourself to such a man to an absolute stranger what is his name at the time he called himself freeman later in his letters he signed himself alfred johnston and where did he come from from finmark he said for the rest he was born in finland had come to norway there as a child with his father i think a finlander then yes so he called himself what else do you know about him only that he went to sea very young and that he had been on long voyages nothing more no we never spoke of such things of what did you speak then we spoke mostly about the sea ah about the sea about storms and calm of dark nights at sea and of the sea in the glittering sunshiny days we spoke also but we spoke most of the whales and the dolphins and the seals who lie out there on the rocks in the midday sun and then we spoke of the gulls and the eagles and all the other sea-birds i think isn't it wonderful when we talked of such things it seemed to me as if both the sea-beasts and sea-birds were one with him and with you yes i almost thought i belonged to them all too well well and so it was that you betrothed yourself to him yes he said i must you must had you no will of your own then not when he was near oh afterwards i thought it all so inexplicable were you often together no not very often one day he came out to our place and looked over the lighthouse after that i got to know him and we met now and again but then that happened about the captain and so he had to go away yes yes tell me more about that it was just daybreak when i had a note from him he said in it that i was to go out to him at the brathammer you know the headland there between the lighthouse and skjoldviken i know i know i was to go out there at once he wrote because he wanted to speak to me and you went yes i could not do otherwise well then he told me that he had stabbed the captain in the night he said that himself actually said so yes but he had only acted rightly and justly he said rightly and justly why did he stab him then he wouldn't speak out about that he said it was not fit for me to hear and you believed his naked bare word yes it never occurred to me to do otherwise well anyhow he had to go away but now when he was to bid me farewell no you never could imagine what he thought of well tell me he took from his pocket a key-ring and drew a ring that he always wore from his finger and he took a small ring i had these two he put on the key-ring and then he said we should wed ourselves to the sea wed yes so he said and with that he threw the key-ring and our rings with all his might as far as he could into the deep and you elida you did all this yes only think it seemed then to me as if it must be so but thank god he went away and when he was gone oh you can surely understand that i soon came to my senses again that i saw how absolutely mad and meaningless it all had been but you spoke just now of letters so you have heard from him since yes i have heard from him first i had a few short lines from archangel he only wrote that he was going to america 
and then he told me where to send an answer. And did you? At once. I wrote him, of course, that all must be at an end between us, and that he must no longer think of me, just as I should no longer think of him. But did he write again? Yes, he wrote again. And what was his answer to your communication? He took no notice of it. It was exactly as if I had never broken with him. He wrote quite composedly and calmly that I must wait for him. When he could have me he would let me know, and then I was to go to him at once. So he would not release you? No. Then I wrote again, almost word for word as I had before, or perhaps more firmly. And he gave in? Oh, no, don't think that. He wrote quietly as before, not a word of my having broken with him. Then I knew it was useless, and so I never wrote to him again. And you never heard from him? Oh, yes. I have had three letters since then. Once he wrote to me from California, and a second time from China. The last letter I had from him was from Australia. He wrote he was going to the gold mines, but since then he has made no sign. This man has had a strange power over you, Elida. Yes, yes, the terrible man. But you mustn't think of that any more. Never again, never. Promise me that, my dear beloved Elida. Now we must try another treatment for you, fresher air than here within the fjords, the salt, fresh air of the sea. Dear, what say you to that? Oh, don't speak of it. Don't think of it. There is no help in this for me. I feel that so well. I can't shake it off, not even there. What, dear? What do you really mean? I mean the horror of it, this incomprehensible power over the mind. But you have shaken it off, long since, when you broke with him. Why, all this is long past now. Elida, springing up. No, that it is not, it is not. Not past? No, Vungel, it is not past, and I fear it will never be, never in all our life. Do you mean to say that in your innermost heart you have never been able to forget this strange man? I had forgotten him, but then it was as if he had suddenly come back again. How long ago is that? It's about three years ago now, or a little longer. It was just when I expected the child. Ah, at that time. Yes, Alida, now I begin to understand many things. You are mistaken, dear. What has come to me? Oh, I believe nothing on earth will ever make it clear. Vangel, looking sadly at her. Only to think that all these three years you have cared for another man. Cared for another. Not for me, but for another. Oh, you are so utterly mistaken. I care for no one but you. Why, then, in all this time have you not lived with me as my wife? Because of the horror that comes from the strange man. The horror? Yes, the horror. A horror so terrible, such as only the sea could hold. For now you shall hear, Vongel. The young townsfolk come back from the left, bow and pass out right. Together with them come Arnholm, Bolette, Hilde, and Linkstrand. Bolette, as she passes by, Well, are you still walking about up here? Yes, it is so cool and pleasant up here on the heights. We, for our part, are going down for a dance. All right, we'll soon come down, we also. Goodbye for the present. Mr. Linkstrand, will you wait one moment? Linkstrand stops. Arnholm, Bolette, and Hilde go out right. To Lingstrand. Are you going to dance, too? No, Mrs. Vungel, I, I don't think I dare. No, you should be careful, you know. Your chest. You're not quite well yet, you see. Not quite. How long may it be now since you went on that voyage? That time when I contracted this weakness. Yes, that voyage you told me about this morning. Oh, it's about... Wait a moment. Uh... Yes, it's a good three years now. Three years, then. Well, perhaps a little more. We left America in February, and we were wrecked in March. It was the equinoctial gales we came in for. Elida, looking at Vangel. So it was at that time. But, dear Elida... Well, don't let me detain you, Mr. Lingstrand. Now go down, but don't dance. 
No, I'll, I'll only look on. He goes out right. Johnston was on board, too. I'm quite certain of it. What makes you think so? He learnt on board that I had married another while he was away. And so that very hour this came over me. The horror? Yes. All of a sudden I see him alive right in front of me, or rather a little in profile. He never looks at me. Only he is there. How do you think he looks? Exactly as when I saw him last. Ten years ago? Yes, out there at Brathamran. Most distinctly of all I see his breastpin, with a large bluish-white pearl in it. The pearl is like a dead fish's eye, and it seems to glare at me. Good God, you are more ill than I thought, more ill than you yourself know, Elida. Yes, yes, help me if you can, for I feel how it is drawing closer and more close. And you have gone about in this state three whole years, bearing for yourself this secret suffering, without confiding in me. But I could not, not till it became necessary for your own sake. If I had confided in you, I should also have had to confide to you the unutterable. Unutterable? No, 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 do not ask. Only one thing, nothing more. Wangel, when shall we understand that mystery of the boy's eyes? My dear love, Elida, I assure you it was only your own fancy. The child had exactly the same eyes as other normal children have. No, he had not. And you could not see it. The child's eyes changed colour with the sea. When the fjord lay bathed in sunshine, so were his eyes, that so in storm. Oh, I saw it if you did not. Maybe. But even if it were true, what then? Elida, in lower voice and coming nearer. I have seen such eyes before. Well, where? Out at brought Amorin, ten years ago. Wangel, stepping back. What does it mean? The child had the strange man's eyes. Elida? Elida clasps her hands despairingly about her head. Now you understand why I would not, why I dared not live with you as your wife. She turns suddenly and rushes off over the heights. Wangel, hurrying after her and calling. Elida, Elida, my poor unhappy Elida. End of Act Two Act Three of The Lady from the Sea by Henrik Ibsen Translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three. A more remote part of Dr. Wangel's garden. It is boggy and overshadowed by large old trees. To the right is seen the margin of a dank pond. A low open fence separates the garden from the footpath and the fjord in the background. Beyond is the range of mountains with its peaks. It is afternoon, almost evening. Boletus sits on a stone seat, and on the seat lie some books and a work-basket. Hilde and Linkstrand, both with fishing tackle, walk along the bank of the pond. Hilde making a sign to Linkstrand. I can see a large one. Linkstrand looking. Where? Hilde pointing. Can't you see? He's down there. Good gracious, there's another. Looks through the trees. Out there. Now he's coming to frighten him away. Bolette looking up. Who's coming? Your tutor, miss. Mine? Yes. Goodness knows he was never mine. Arnholm enters right from between the trees. Are they fish in the pond now? There are some very ancient carp. No. Are the old carp still alive? Yes. They're pretty tough. But now we're going to try and get rid of some of them. You'd better try out there at the fjord. No. The pond is, well, so to say, more mysterious. Yes, it's fascinating here. Have you been in the sea? Yes, I've come straight from the baths. I suppose you kept in the enclosure. Yes, I'm not much of a swimmer. Can you swim on your back? No. I can. 
to Lingstrand. Let's try out there, on the other side. They go off along the pond right. Arnholm coming closer to Bolette. Are you sitting all alone here, Bolette? Yes, I generally do. Isn't your mother down here in the garden? No, she's sure to be out with father. How is she this afternoon? I don't quite know. I forgot to ask. What books have you there? The one's something about botany, and the other's a geography. Do you care about such things? Yes, if only I had time for it. But first of all, I've to look after the housekeeping. Doesn't your mother help you, your stepmother? Doesn't she help you with that? No, that's my business. Why, I saw to that during the two years father was alone. And so it has been since. But you're as fond as ever of reading. Yes, I read all the useful books I can get hold of. One wants to know something about the world. For here we live so completely outside of all that's going on. Or almost. Now, don't say that, dear Bolette. Yes. I think we live very much as the carp down there in the pond. They have the fjords so near them, where the shoals of wild fishes pass in and out. But the poor tame house fishes know nothing, and they can take no part in that. I don't think it would fare very well with them if they could get out there. Oh, it would be much the same, I expect. Moreover, you can't say that one is so completely out of the world here. Not in the summer, anyhow. Why, nowadays this is quite a rendezvous for the busy world, almost a terminus for the time being. Ah, yes. You who yourself are only here for the time being. It is easy for you to make fun of us. I make fun? How can you think that? Well, all that about this being a rendezvous and a terminus for the busy world, that's something you've heard the townsfolk here saying. Yes, they're in the habit of saying that sort of thing. Well, frankly, I've noticed that too. But really there's not an atom of truth in it. Not for us who always live here. What good is it to us that the great strange world comes hither for a time on its way north to see the midnight sun? We ourselves have no part in that. We see nothing of the midnight sun. No, we've got to be good and live our lives here, in our carp pond. Arnholm sitting down by her. Now tell me, dear Bolette, isn't there something or other, something definite you are longing for? Perhaps. What is it, really? What is it you are longing for? Chiefly to get away. That above all, then? Yes. And then to learn more, to really know something about everything. When I used to teach you, your father often said he would let you go to college. Yes, poor father. He says so many things. But when it comes to the point, he... There's no real stamina in father. No, unfortunately, you're right there. He has not exactly stamina. But have you ever spoken to him about it, spoken really earnestly and seriously? No, I've not quite done that. But really, you ought to, before it is too late, Bolette. Why don't you? Oh, I suppose it's because there's no real stamina in me, either. I certainly take after father in that. Hmm. Don't you think you're unjust to yourself there? No, unfortunately. Besides, father has so little time for thinking of me and my future, and not much desire to, either. He prefers to put such things away from him whenever he can. He is so completely taken up with Elida. With whom? What? I mean that he and my stepmother. Father and mother suffice one another, as you see. Well, so much the better if you were to get away from here. Yes, but I don't think I've a right to. Not to forsake father. But, dear Bolette, you'll have to do that some time, anyhow. So it seems to me the sooner the better. I suppose there is nothing else for it. After all, I must think of myself, too. I must try and get occupation of some sort. When once father's gone, I have no one to hold to. But poor father! I dread leaving him. Dread? Yes, for father's sake. But, good heavens! Your stepmother? She is left to him? That's true. But she's not in the least fit to do all that mother did so well. There is so much she doesn't see, or that she won't see, or that she doesn't care about. I don't know which it is. Hmm. I think I understand what you mean. Poor father. He is weak in some things. Perhaps you've noticed that yourself. He hasn't enough occupation either to fill up his time. And then she is so thoroughly incapable of helping him. However, that's to some extent his own fault. In what way? 
Oh, father always likes to see happy faces about him. There must be sunshine and joy in the house, he says. And so I'm afraid he often gives her medicine which will do her little good in the long run. Do you really think that? Yes, I can't get rid of the thought. She is so odd at times. But isn't it unjust that I should have to stay at home here? Really, it's not of any earthly use to father. Besides, I have a duty towards myself, too, I think. Do you know what, Bolette? We two must talk these matters over more carefully. Oh, that won't be much use. I suppose I was created to stay here in the carp pond. Not a bit of it. It depends entirely upon yourself. Do you think so? Yes, believe me, it lies wholly and solely in your own hands. If only that were true, will you perhaps put in a good word for me with father? Certainly. But first of all, I must speak frankly and freely with you yourself, dear. Bolette looks out left. Hush! Don't let them notice anything. We'll speak of this later. Elida enters from the left. She has no hat on, but a large shawl is thrown over her head and shoulders. Elida with restless animation. How pleasant it is here! How delightful it is here! Arnholm, rising. Have you been for a walk? Yes, a long, long, lovely walk up there with Vongel. And now we're going for a sail. Won't you sit down? No, thanks. I won't sit down. Bolette making room on seat. Here's a pleasant seat. Elida walking about. No, 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 I won't sit down, not sit down. I'm sure your walk has done you good. You look quite refreshed. Oh, I feel so thoroughly well. I feel so unspeakably happy. So safe, so safe. Looking out left. What great steamer is that coming along there? Bolette rising and also looking out. It must be the large English ship. It's passing the buoy. Does it usually stop here? Only for half an hour. It goes farther up the fjord. And then sails away again tomorrow. Away over the great open sea. Right over the sea. Only think, to be with them. If one could, if only one could. Have you never been any long sea voyage, Mrs. Wangel? Never. Only those little trips in the fjord here. Ah, no. I suppose we must put up with the dry land. Well, after all, that really is our home. No, I don't think it is. Not the land? No, I don't believe so. I think that if only men had from the beginning accustomed themselves to living on the sea, or in the sea, perhaps, we should be more perfect than we are, both better and happier. You really think that? Yes. I should like to know if we should not. I've often spoken to Vongel about it. Well, and he? He thinks it might be so. Well, perhaps, but it can't be helped. We have once and for all entered upon the wrong path, and have become land beasts instead of sea beasts. Anyhow, I suppose it's too late to make good the mistake now. Yes, you've spoken a sad truth. And I think men instinctively feel something of this themselves. And they bear it about with them as a secret regret and sorrow. Believe me, herein lies the deepest cause for the sadness of men. Yes, believe me, in this. But, my dearest Mrs. Wangel, I have not observed that men are so extremely sad. It seems to me, on the contrary, that most of them take life easily and pleasantly, and with a great, quiet, unconscious joy. Oh, no, it is not so. The joy is, I suppose, something like our joy at the long, pleasant summer days. It has the presentiment of the dark days coming. And it is this presentiment that casts its shadows over the joy of men, just as the driving clouds cast their shadow over the fjords. It lies there so bright and blue, and of a sudden— You shouldn't give way to such sad thoughts. Just now you were so glad and so bright. Yes. Yes, so I was. Oh, this—this this is so stupid of me. Looking about her uneasily. If only Vongel would come. He promised me so faithfully he would. And yet he does not come. Dear Mr. Arnholm, won't you try and find him for me? Gladly. Tell him he must come here directly now, for I can't see him. Not see him? Oh, you don't understand. 
When he is not by me I often can't remember how he looks. And then it is as if I had quite lost him. Oh, that is so terribly painful. But do go, please." She paces round the pond. Bolette to Arnholm. I will go with you. You don't know the way. Nonsense. I shall be all right. Bolette aside. No, no, no. I am anxious. I am afraid he is on board the steamer. Afraid? Yes. He usually goes to see if there are any acquaintances of his. And there's a restaurant on board. Ah, come then. He and Bolette go off left. Elida stands still a while, staring down at the pond. Now and again she speaks to herself in a low voice and breaks off. Along the footpath beyond the garden fence a stranger in travelling dress comes from left. His hair and beard are bushy and red. He has a scotch cap on and a travelling bag with strap across his shoulders. The stranger goes slowly along by the fence and peeps into the garden. When he catches sight of Elida, he stands still, looks at her fixedly and searchingly, and speaks in a low voice. Good evening, Elida. Elida turns round with a cry. Oh, dear, have you come at last? Yes, at last. Elida, looking at him astonished and frightened. Who are you? Do you seek any one here? You surely know that well enough, Elida. Elida, starting. What is this? How do you address me? Whom are you looking for? Well, I suppose I'm looking for you. Elida, shuddering. Oh! She stares at him, totters back, uttering a half-suffocating cry. Oh, the eyes! The eyes! Are you beginning to recognize me at last? I knew you at once, Elida. The eyes! Don't look at me like that! I shall cry for help! Hush! Hush! Do not fear. I shan't hurt you. Elida, covering her eyes with her hands. Do not look at me like that, I say. The stranger, leaning with his arms on the garden fence. I came with the English steamer. Elida, stealing a frightened look at him. What do you want with me? I promised you to come as soon as I could. Go. Go away. Never, never come here again. I wrote to you that everything must be over between us. Everything. Oh, you know that. The stranger, imperturbably, and not answering her. I would gladly have come to you sooner, but I could not. Now, at last, I am able to, and I am here, Alida. What is it you want with me? What do you mean? Why have you come here? Surely you know I've come to fetch you. Alida recoils in terror. To fetch me? Is that what you really mean? Of course. But surely you know that I am married? Yes, I know. And yet, and yet you have come to, to fetch me? Certainly I have. Elida, seizing her head with both her hands. Oh, this misery, this horror, this horror. Perhaps you don't want to come. Don't look at me like that. I was asking you if you didn't want to come. No, 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 never in all eternity. I will not, I tell you. I neither can nor will. I dare not. The stranger climbs over the fence and comes into the garden. Well, Elida, let me tell you one thing before I go. Elida wishes to fly, but cannot. She stands as one paralyzed with terror, and leans for support against the trunk of a tree by the pond. Don't touch me. Don't come near me. No nearer. Don't touch me, I say. The stranger, cautiously coming a few steps nearer. You need not be so afraid of me, Elida. Elida, covering her eyes with her hands. Don't look at me like that. Do not be afraid. Not afraid. Dr. Wangel comes through the garden from the left. Wangel, still halfway between the trees. Well, you've had to wait for me a long time. Elida rushes towards him, clings fast to his arm, and cries out. Oh, Wangel, save me! You save me if you can! Elida, what in heaven's name? Save me, Wangel, don't you see him there? Why, he is standing there. Wangel, looking thither. That man? Coming nearer. May I ask you who you are and what you have come into this garden for? The stranger motions with a nod towards Elida. I want to talk to her. Oh, indeed. So I suppose it was you. 
to elida i hear a stranger has been to the house and asked for you yes it was i and what do you want with my wife turning round do you know him elida elida in a low voice and wringing her hands do i know him yes 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 well why it is he vongo he himself he who you know what what is it you say turning are you the johnston who once you may call me johnston for aught i care however that is not my name it is not it is no longer no and what may you want with my wife for i suppose you know the light housekeeper's daughter has been married this long time and whom she married you of course also know i have known it over three years how did you come to know it i was on my way home to you elida i came across an old newspaper it was a paper from these parts and in it there was that about the marriage elida looking straight in front of her the marriage so it was that it seemed so wonderful to me for the rings why that too was a marriage elida elida covering her face with her hands oh how dare you have you forgotten that elida feeling his look suddenly cries out don't stand there and look at me like that wangel goes up to him you must deal with me and not with her in short now that you know the circumstances what is it you really want here why do you seek my wife i promised elida to come to her as soon as i could elida again and elida promised faithfully she would wait for me until i came i notice you call my wife by her first name this kind of familiarity is not customary with us here i know that perfectly but as she first and above all belongs to me to you still elida draws back behind wangel oh he will never release me to you you say she belongs to you has she told you anything about the two rings my ring and elida's certainly and what then she put an end to that long ago you have had her letter so you know this yourself both elida and i agreed that what we did should have all the strength and authority of a real and full marriage but you hear i will not never on earth do i wish to know anything more of you do not look at me like that i will not i tell you you must be mad to think you can come here and base any claim upon such childish nonsense that's true a claim in your sense i certainly have not what do you mean to do then you surely do not imagine you can take her from me by force against her own will no what would be the good of that if elida wishes to be with me she must come freely elida starts crying out freely and you actually believe that elida to herself freely you must have taken leave of your senses go your ways we have nothing more to do with you the stranger looking at his watch it is almost time for me to go on board again coming nearer yes yes elida now i have done my duty coming still nearer i have kept the word i gave you elida beseechingly drawing away oh don't touch me and so now you must think it over till tomorrow night there is nothing to think over here see that you get away the stranger still to elida now i'm going with the steamer up the fjord tomorrow night i will come again and then i shall look for you here you must wait for me here in the garden for i prefer settling the matter with you alone you understand do you hear that vongo only keep calm we shall know how to prevent this visit good-bye for the present elida so to-morrow night oh no no do not come to-morrow night never come here again and should you then have a mind to follow me overseas oh don't look at me like that i only mean that you must be ready to set out go up to the house elida i cannot oh help me save me vongo for you must remember that if you do not go with me to-morrow all is at an end elida looks tremblingly at him then all is at an end for ever the stranger nodding nothing can change it then elida i shall never again come to this land you will never see me again nor hear from me either then i shall be as one dead and gone from you for ever elida breathing with difficulty <sighs> oh 
so think carefully what you do. Goodbye. He goes to the fence and climbs over it, stands still, and says, Yes, Alida, be ready for the journey tomorrow night, for then I shall come and fetch you. He goes slowly and calmly down the footpath and exit right. Elida, looking after him for a time. Freely, he said. Think. He said that I must go with him freely. Only keep calm. Why, he's gone now, and you'll never see him again. Oh, how can you say that? He's coming again tomorrow night. Let him come. He shall not meet you again in any case. Elida, shaking her head. Oh, Vongel, do not believe you can prevent him. I can, dearest. Only trust me. Elida, pondering and not listening to him. Now when he's been here tomorrow night, and then when he has gone overseas in the steamer. Yes, what then? I should like to know if he will never, never come back again. No, dear Elida, you may be quite sure of that. What should he do here after this, now that he has learnt from your own lips that you will have nothing more to do with him? With that the whole thing is over. Elida to herself. Tomorrow, then, or never. And should it ever occur to him to come here again? Well? Why, then, it is in our power to make him harmless. Oh, do not think that. It is in our power, I tell you. If you can get rid of him in no other way, he must expiate the murder of the captain. No, 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 never that. We know nothing about the murder of the captain, nothing whatever. No, nothing? Why, he himself confessed it to you. No, nothing of that. If you say anything of it, I shall deny it. He shall not be imprisoned. He belongs out there to the open sea. He belongs out there. Wangel looks at her and says slowly, Ah, Elida, Elida. Elida clinging passionately to him. Oh, dear, faithful one, save me from this man. Wangel disengaging himself gently. Come, come with me. Lingstrand and Hilde, both with fishing tackle, come in from the right along the pond. Lingstrand going quickly up to Elida. Now, Mrs. Wangel, you must hear something wonderful. What is it? Fancy! We have seen the American. The American? Yes, I saw him too. He, he was going round the back of the garden and thence on board the great english steamer how do you know the man why i went to sea with him once i felt so certain he'd been drowned and now he's very much alive do you know anything more about him no but i'm sure he's come to revenge himself upon his faithless sailor wife what do you mean lingstrand's going to use him for a work of art i don't understand one word you shall hear afterwards Arnholm and Bolette come from the left, along the footpath outside the garden. Bolette to those in the garden. Do come and see. The great English steamer is just going up the fjord. A large steamer glides slowly past in the distance. Lingstrand to Hilde behind the garden fence. Tonight he's sure to come to her. Hilde nods. To the faithless sailor wife, yes. Fancy! At midnight! That must be so fascinating. Elida, looking after the ship. Tomorrow, then. And then never again. Oh, Vongo, save me from myself. Vangel looks anxiously at her. Elida, I feel there is something behind this. There is the temptation. Temptation? The man is like the sea. She goes slowly and thoughtfully through the garden and out left. Wangel walks uneasily by her side, watching her closely. End of Act 3 Act 4 of The Lady from the Sea by Henrik Ibsen Translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Act Four, Doctor Wangel's Garden Room, doors right and left. In the background, between the windows, an open glass door leading out onto the veranda. Below this, a portion of the garden is visible. A sofa and table down left. 
to right a piano and farther back a large flower stand in the middle of the room a round table with chairs on the table is a rose tree in bloom and other plants round it morning in the room by the table left bolette is sitting on the sofa busy with some embroidery lingstrand is seated on a chair at the upper end of the table in the garden below ballestedt sits painting hilda stands by watching him lingstrand with his arms on the table sits silent a while looking at bolette's work it must be awfully difficult to do a border like that miss wangel oh no it's not very difficult if only you take care to count right to count must you count too yes the stitches see oh, so you do just fancy well, it's almost a kind of art can you design too oh yes when i've a copy not unless no well then after all it's not a real art no it is rather only a sort of handicraft but still i think that perhaps you could learn art if i haven't any talent yes if you could always be with a real true artist do you think then i could learn it from him well, not exactly learn in the ordinary sense but i think it would grow upon you little by little by a kind of miracle as it were miss bungle that would be wonderful <clears throat> have you ever thought about i mean have you ever thought deeply and earnestly about marriage miss wangel about no i have really have you oh yes i uh, often think about things of that sort and especially about marriage and <clears throat> besides i've read several books about it i think marriage must be counted a sort of miracle that a woman should gradually change till she is like her husband you mean has like interests yes um, uh, that's it well but his abilities his talents and his skill mm, well i should like to know if all that too then perhaps you also believe that everything a man has read for himself and thought out for himself that this too can grow upon his wife yes i i think it can little by little as by a sort of miracle but of, of course i know such things can only happen in a marriage that is uh, faithful and loving and, and really happy has it never occurred to you that a man too might perhaps be thus drawn over to his wife grow like her i mean a man well, no i never thought of that but why not one as well as the other no for a man has a calling that he lives for and that's what makes a man so strong and firm miss wangel he has a calling in life has every man oh no i'm thinking more especially of artists do you think it right of an artist to get married <laughs> yes i think so if he can find one he can heartily love i still i think he should rather live for his art alone of course he must but he can do that just as well even if he marries but how about her her who she whom he marries what is she to live for uh, sh she too is to live for his art it, it seems to me that a woman must feel so thoroughly happy in that hm i don't exactly know yes miss wangel you may be sure of that it is not merely all the honour and respect she enjoys through him uh, for that seems almost the least important to me but it is this that she can help him to create that she can lighten his work for him be about him and see to his comfort and tend him well and make his life thoroughly pleasant i, I should think that must be perfectly delightful to a woman ah oh, you don't yourself know how selfish you are i selfish good heavens oh if only you knew me a little better than you do bending closer to her miss wangel when once i am gone and that will be very soon now bolette looks pityingly at him oh don't think of anything so sad but really i don't think it is so very sad what do you mean well you know that i set out in a month first from here and then of course i'm, I'm going south oh i see of course <laughs> will you uh think of me sometimes then miss wangel yes gladly no <laughs> promise I promise. By all that is sacred, Miss Bolletta. By all that is sacred. 
Oh, but what can come of it all? Nothing on earth can come of it. How can you say that? It would be so delightful for me to know you were at home here thinking of me. Well, and what else? I, I don't exactly know of anything else. Nor I either. There are so many things in the way. Everything stands in the way, I think. Oh, another miracle might come about some happy dispensation of fortune or something of the sort. For I really believe that I shall be lucky now. Really? You do believe that? Yes, I believe it thoroughly. And so, after a few years, uh, when I come home again as a celebrated sculptor and well off and in perfect health. Yes, yes, of course. We will hope so. You may be perfectly certain about it. Only think faithfully and kindly of me when I am down there in the south, and now I have your word that you will. You have. Shaking her head. But all the same, nothing will surely come of it. Oh, yes, Miss Valletta. At least this will come of it. I shall get on so much more easily and quickly with my artwork. Do you believe that, too? I have an inner conviction of it. And I fancy it will be so cheering for you, too, here in this out-of-the-way place, to know within yourself that you are, so to speak, helping me to create. Well, but you on your side? I? Boletta, looking out into the garden. Hush, let us speak of something else. Here's Mr. Arnholm. Arnholm is seen in the garden below left. He stops and talks to Hilde and polished it. Are you fond of your old teacher, Miss Boletta? Fond of him? Yes, I mean, do you care for him? Yes, indeed I do, for he is a true friend, and adviser too, and then he is always so ready to help when he can. Isn't it extraordinary that he hasn't married? Do you think it is extraordinary? Yes, for you say he's well-to-do. He is certainly said to be so, but probably it wasn't so easy to find anyone who'd have him. Why? Oh, he's been the teacher of nearly all the young girls that he knows. He says that himself. Why does that matter? Why, good heavens! One doesn't marry a man who's been your teacher. Don't you think a young girl might love her teacher? Not after she's really grown up. <sighs> no. <laughs> Fancy that. Shh! Shh! Meanwhile, Balishted has been gathering together his things and carries them out from the garden right. Hilda helps him. Arnholm goes up the veranda and comes into the room. Good morning, my dear Bolette. Good morning, Mr. Mr. Hmm. He looks displeased and nods coldly to Lingstrand, who rises. Boletta rising up and going up to Arnholm. Good morning, Mr. Arnholm. Everything all right here today? Yes, thanks, quite. Has your stepmother gone to bathe again today? No, she is upstairs in her room. Not very bright? I don't know, for she has locked herself in. Hmm, has she? I suppose Mrs. Vongel was very much frightened about that American yesterday. What do you know about that? I told Mrs. Vongel that I had seen him in the flesh behind the garden. Oh, I see. Boletta to Arnholm. No doubt you and father sat up very late last night talking. Yes, rather late. We were talking over serious matters. Did you put in a word for me and my affairs, too? No, dear Boletta, I couldn't manage it. He was so completely taken up with something else. Ah, yes. He always is. Arnholm looks at her meaningly. But later on today we'll talk more fully about uh, the matter. Where's your father now? Not at home? Yes, he is. He must be down in the office. I'll fetch him. No, thanks. Don't do that. I'd rather go down to him. Bolette, listening left. Wait one moment, Mr. Arnholm. I believe that's father on the stairs. Yes, I suppose he's been up to look after her. Dr. Wangel comes in from the door left. Wangel shaking Arnholm's hand. What, dear friend, are you here already? It was good of you to come so early, for I should like to talk a little further with you. Bolette to Lingstrand. Hadn't we better go down to Hilda in the garden? I shall be delighted, Miss Wangel. He and Bolette go down into the garden and pass out between the trees in the background. Arnholm, following them with his eyes, turns to Wangel. Do you know anything about that young man? No, nothing at all. But do you think it right he should knock about so much with the girls? Does he? I really hadn't noticed it. You ought to see to it, I think. 
yes i suppose you're right but good lord what's a man to do the girls are so accustomed to look after themselves now they won't listen to me nor to elida not to her either no and besides i really cannot expect elida to trouble about such things she's not fit for that but it wasn't that which we were to talk of now tell me have you thought the matter over thought over all i told you of i have thought of nothing else ever since we parted last night and what do you think should be done dear wangel i think you as a doctor must know that better than i oh if you only knew how difficult it is for a doctor to judge rightly about a patient who is so dear to him besides this is no ordinary illness no ordinary doctor and no ordinary medicines can help her how is she to-day i was upstairs with her just now and then she seemed to me quite calm but behind all her moods something lies hidden which it is impossible for me to fathom and then she is so changeable so capricious she varies so suddenly no doubt that is the result of her morbid state of mind not altogether when you go down to the bedrock it was born in her elida belongs to the sea folk that is the matter what do you really mean my dear doctor haven't you noticed that the people from out there by the open sea are in a way a people apart it is almost as if they themselves lived the life of the sea there is the rush of waves and ebb and flow too both in their thoughts and in their feelings and so they can never bear transplanting ah i ought to have remembered that it was a sin against Alida to take her away from there and bring her here. You have come to that opinion? Yes, more and more. But I ought to have told myself this beforehand. Oh, I knew it well enough at bottom, but I put it from me. For, you see, I loved her so. Therefore, I thought of myself first of all. I was inexcusably selfish at that time. Hmm i suppose every man is a little selfish under such circumstances moreover i have never noticed that vice in you dr wangel wangel walks uneasily about the room oh yes and i have been since then too why i am so much much older than she is i ought to have been at once as a father to her and a guide i ought to have done my best to develop and enlighten her mind unfortunately nothing ever came of that you see i hadn't stamina enough for i preferred her just as she was so things went worse and worse with her and then i didn't know what to do that was why i wrote to you in my trouble and asked you to come here arnholm looks at him in astonishment what was it for this you wrote yes but don't let anyone notice anything how on earth dear doctor what good do you expect me to be i don't understand it no naturally for i was on an altogether false track i thought elida's heart had at one time gone out to you and that she still secretly cared for you a little that perhaps it would do her good to see you again and talk of her home and the old days so it was your wife you meant when you wrote that she expected me and and perhaps longed for me yes who else no no you're right but i didn't understand naturally as i said for i was on an absolutely wrong track and you call yourself selfish ah but i had such a great sin to atone for i felt i dared not neglect any means that might give the slightest relief to her mind but how do you really explain the power this stranger exercises over her hmm dear friend there may be sides to the matter that cannot be explained do you mean anything inexplicable in itself absolutely inexplicable in any case not explicable as far as we know do you believe there is something in it then i neither believe nor deny i simply don't know that's why i leave it alone yes but just one thing her extraordinary weird assertion about the child's eyes i don't believe a word about the eyes i will not believe such a thing it must be purely fancy on her part nothing else did you notice the man's eyes when you saw him yesterday of course i did 
and you saw no sort of resemblance mm. good heavens what shall i say it wasn't quite late when i saw him and besides alida had been saying so much about this resemblance i really don't know if i was capable of observing quite impartially well well maybe but that other matter all this terror and unrest coming upon her at the very time as it seems this strange man was on his way home that no oh, that's something she must have persuaded and dreamed herself into since it happened she was not seized with this so suddenly all at once as she now maintains but since she heard from that young lingstrand that johnston or freeman or whatever his name is was on his way hither three years ago in the month of march she now evidently believes her unrest of mind came upon her at that very time it was not so then by no means there were signs and symptoms of it before this time though it did happen by chance that in that month of march three years ago she had a rather severe attack after all then yes but that is easily accounted for by the circumstances the condition she happened to be in at the time so symptom for symptom then wangel wringing his hands and not to be able to help her not to know how to counsel her to see no way now if you could make up your mind to leave this place to go somewhere else so that she could live amid surroundings that would seem more home-like to her ah dear friend do you think i haven't offered her that too i suggested moving out to skilled Vicon, but she will not not that either no for she doesn't think it would be any good and perhaps she's right hmm do you say that moreover when i think it all over carefully i really don't know how i could manage it i don't think i should be justified for the sake of the girls in going away to such a desolate place after all they must live where there is at least a prospect of their being provided for some day provided for are you thinking about that already heaven knows i must think of that too but then on the other hand again my poor sick elida oh dear arnholm in many respects i seem to be standing between fire and water perhaps you've no need to worry on bolette's account i should like to know where she where they have gone goes up to the open door and looks out oh i would so gladly make any sacrifice for all three of them if only i knew what elida enters from door left elida quickly to wangel be sure you don't go out this morning no no of course not i will stay at home with you pointing to arnholm who is coming towards them but won't you speak to our friend elida turning oh are you here mr arnholm holding out her hand to him good morning good morning mrs wangel so you've not been bathing as usual to-day no 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 that is out of the question to-day but won't you sit down a moment no thanks and not now looks at wangel i promised the girls to go down to them in the garden goodness knows if you'll find them there i never know where they may be out rambling they're sure to be down by the pond oh i shall find them right enough nods and goes out across the veranda into the garden what time is it wangel wangel looking at his watch a little past eleven a little past and at eleven o'clock or half past eleven to-night the steamer is coming oh if only that were over wangel going nearer to her dear elida there is one thing i should like to ask you what is it the evening before last up at the view you said that during the last three years you had so often seen him bodily before you and so i have you may believe that but how did you see him how did i see him i mean how did he look when you thought you saw him but dear wangel why you know yourself how he looks did he look exactly like that in your imagination he did exactly the same as you saw him in reality yesterday evening yes exactly then how was it you did not at once recognize him did i not no you said yourself afterwards that at first you did not at all know who the strange man was i really believe you were right don't you think that strange wangel fancy my not knowing him at once it was only the eyes you said oh yes the eyes the eyes well but at the view you said that he always appeared to you exactly as he was when you parted out there ten years ago did i 
Yes. Then I suppose he did look much as he does now. No. On our way home, the day before yesterday, you gave quite another description of him. Ten years ago he had no beard, you said. His dress, too, was quite different. And that breast-pin with the pearl? That man yesterday wore nothing of the sort. No, he did not. Wangel looks searchingly at her. Now just think a little, dear Alida. Or perhaps you can't quite remember how he looked when he stood by you at Brathammer. Elida thoughtfully closing her eyes for a moment. Not quite distinctly. No, today I cannot. Is it not strange? Not so very strange, after all. You have now been confronted by a new and real image, and that overshadows the old one so that you can no longer see it. Do you believe that, Vongo? Yes, and it overshadows your sick imaginings, too. That is why it is good a reality has come good do you think it good yes that it has come it may restore you to health elida sitting down on sofa vongo come and sit down by me i must tell you all my thoughts yes do dear elida he sits down on a chair on the other side of the table it was really a great misfortune for us both that we two of all people should have come together what are you saying oh yes it was and it's so natural. It could bring nothing but unhappiness, after the way in which we came together. What was there in that way? Listen, Wangel, it's no use going on lying to ourselves and to one another. Are we doing so? Lying, you say? Yes, we are. Or at least we suppress the truth. For the truth, the pure and simple truth is that you came out there and bought me. Bought? You say bought? Oh, I wasn't a bit better than you. I accepted the bargain. Sold myself to you. Wangel looks at her full of pain. Elida, have you really the heart to call it that? But is there any other name for it? You could no longer bear the emptiness of your house. You were on the lookout for a new wife. And a new mother for the children, Elida. That too, perhaps, by the way. Although you didn't in the least know if I were fit for the position. Why, you had only seen me and spoken to me a few times. Then you wanted me, and so— Yes, you may call it as you will. And I, on my side. Why, I was so helpless and bewildered and so absolutely alone. Oh, it was so natural I should accept the bargain when you came and proposed to provide for me all my life. Assuredly, it did not seem to me a providing for you, dear Alida i asked you honestly if you would share with me and the children the little i could call my own yes you did but all the same i should never have accepted never have accepted that at any price not sold myself better the meanest work better the poorest life after one's own choice Wangel, rising then have the five six years that we have lived together been so utterly worthless to you Oh, don't think that, Wangel. I have been as well cared for here as human being could desire. But I did not enter your house freely. That is the thing. Wangel, looking at her. Not freely? No. It was not freely that I went with you. Ah, I remember your words of yesterday. It all lies in those words. They have enlightened me. And so I see it all now. What do you see? I see that the life we two live together is really no marriage. You have spoken truly there. The life we now live is not a marriage. Nor was it formerly. Never. Not from the very first. Look straight in front of her. The first. That might have been a complete and real marriage. The first? What do you mean? Mine. With him. Wangel looks at her in astonishment. I do not in the least understand you. Oh, dear Wangel, let us not lie to one another, nor to ourselves. Well, what more? You see, we can never get away from that one thing, that a freely given promise is fully as binding as a marriage. But what on earth? Elida, rising impetuously. Set me free, Wangel. Elida, Elida. Yes, yes, oh, grant me that. Believe me, it will come to that all the same, after the way we two came together. 
bungle conquering his pains it has come to this then it has come to this it could not be otherwise bungle looking gloomily at her so i have not won you by our living together never never possessed you quite oh Vongo, if only i could love you how gladly i would as dearly as you deserve but i feel it so well that will never be divorce then is it a divorce complete legal divorce that you want oh, dear you understand me so little i care nothing for such formalities such outer things matter nothing i think what i want is that we should of our own free will release each other wangel bitterly not slowly to cry off the bargain again yes exactly to cry off the bargain and then elida afterwards have you reflected what life would be to both of us what life would be to both you and me no matter things must turn out afterwards as they may what i beg and implore of you wangel is the most important only set me free give me back my complete freedom elida it is a fearful thing you ask of me at least give me time to collect myself before i come to a decision let us talk it over more carefully and you yourself take time to consider what you are doing but we have no time to lose with such matters i must have my freedom again to-day why to-day because he is coming to-night wangel starts coming he what has this stranger to do with it i want to face him in perfect freedom and what what else do you intend to do i will not hide behind the fact that i am the wife of another man nor make the excuse that i have no choice for then it would be no decision you speak of a choice choice elida a choice in such a matter yes i must be free to choose to choose for either side i must be able to let him go away alone or to go with him do you know what you are saying go with him give your whole life into his hands didn't i give my life into your hands and without any ado maybe but he he an absolute stranger a man of whom you know so little oh, but after all i knew you even less and yet i went with you then you knew to some extent what life lay before you but now think what do you know you know absolutely nothing not even who or what he is elida looking in front of her that is true but that is the terror yes indeed it is terrible that is why i feel i must plunge into it because it seems terrible yes because of that wangel coming closer listen elida what do you really mean by terrible the terrible is that which repels and attracts attracts you say attracts most of all i think you are one with the sea that too is a terror and that terror is in you you both repel and attract do you think so wangel after all i have never really known you never really now i am beginning to understand and that is why you must set me free free me from every bond to you and yours i am not what you took me for now you see it yourself now we can part as friends and freely perhaps it would be better for us both if we parted and yet i cannot you are the terror to me alida the attraction is what is strongest in you do you say that let us try and live through this day wisely in perfect quiet of mind i dare not set you free and release you to-day i have no right to no right for your own sake alida i exercise my right and my duty to protect you protect what is there to protect me from i am not threatened by any outward power the terror lies deeper vongo the terror is the attraction in my own mind and what can you do against that i can strengthen and urge you to fight against it yes if i wished to fight against it then you do not wish to oh i don't know myself to-night all will be decided dear elita yes think the decision so near the decision for one's whole life 
and then to-morrow to-morrow perhaps my real future will have been ruined your real the whole full life of freedom lost lost for me and perhaps for him also wangel in a lower tone seizing her wrist elida do you love this stranger do i oh how can i tell i only know that to me he is a terror and that and that elida tearing herself away and that it is to him i think i belong wangel bowing his head i begin to understand better and what remedy have you for that what advice to give me wangel looking sadly at her to-morrow he will be gone then the misfortune will be averted from your head and then i will consent to set you free we will cry off the bargain to-morrow elida ah oh, wangel to-morrow that is too late wangel looking towards garden the children the children let us spare them at least for the present arnholm bolette hilde and lingstrand come into the garden left lingstrand says good-bye in the garden and goes out left the rest come into the room you must know we have been making plans we're going out to the fjord to-night and no you mustn't tell we too also have been making plans ah oh, really to-morrow elida is going away to skjoldviken for a time going away now look here that's very sensible mrs wangel elida wants to go home again home to the sea hilda springing towards elida you are going away away from us hilda what is the matter oh it's nothing in a low voice turning from her are only you going father i see it you too are going to skjoldviken no no perhaps i shall run out there every now and again and come here to us i will every now and again dear child it must be he crosses the room we will talk it over later Bolette. he crosses to wangel they speak in low tones upstage by the door elida aside to Bolette. what was the matter with hilda she looked quite scared have you never noticed what hilda goes about here day in day out hungering for hungering for ever since you came into the house no no what is it one loving word from you oh if there should be something for me to do here she clasps her hands together over her head and looks fixedly in front of her as if torn by contending thoughts and emotions wangel and arnholm come across the room whispering bolette goes to the side room right and looks in then she throws open the door father dear the table is laid if you wangel with forced composure is it child that's well come arnholm we'll go in and drink a farewell cup with the lady from the sea they go out through the right End of Act Four Act Five of The Lady from the Sea by Henrik Ibsen, translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act V. The distant part of Dr. Wangel's garden and the carp pond. The summer night gradually darkens. Arnholm, Bolette, Lingstrand, and Hilde in a boat, pushing along the shore left. See, we can jump ashore easily here. No, no, don't. I, uh, I can't jump, Miss Hilda. Can't you jump either, Arnholm? I'd rather not try then let's land down there by the bathing steps they push off right at the same moment ballestead comes along the footpath right carrying music books and a french horn he bows to those in the boat turns and speaks to them the answers are heard farther and farther away what do you say yes of course it's on account of the english steamer for this is her last visit here this year but if you want to enjoy the pleasures of melody, you mustn't wait too long. Calling out. What? Shaking his head. Can't hear what you say. 
Elida, with a shawl over her head, enters, followed by Dr. Wangel. But, dear Elida, I assure you there's plenty of time. No, no, there is not. He may come any moment. Ballestedt, outside the fence. Hello. Good evening, doctor. Good evening, Mrs. Wangel. Wangel, noticing him. Oh, is it you? Is there to be music tonight? Yes. The wind band society thought of making themselves heard. We've no dearth of festive occasions nowadays. Tonight it's in the honor of the English ship. The English ship? Is she in sight already? Not yet. But you know she comes from between the islands. You can't see anything of her, and then she's alongside of you. Yes, that is so. Wangel, half to Elida. Tonight is the last voyage, then she will not come again. A sad thought, doctor. And that's why we're going to give them an ovation. As the saying is, ah. Yes, ah. Yes. The glad summer time will soon be over now. Soon all the ways will be barred, as they say in the tragedy. All ways barred. Yes. It's sad to think of. We've been the joyous children of summer for weeks and months now. It's hard to reconcile yourself to the dark days, just at first. I mean, for men can acclim uh, acclimatize themselves, Mrs. Wangle. I, indeed they can. Bows and goes off left. Elida looking out at the fjord. Oh, this terrible suspense, this torturing last half hour before the decision. You are determined then to speak to him yourself. I must speak to him myself, for it is freely that I must make my choice. You have no choice, Elida. You have no right to choose, no right without my permission. You can never prevent the choice, neither you nor any one. You can forbid me to go away with him, to follow him in case I should choose to do that. You can keep me here by force, against my will. That you can do. But that I should choose, choose from my very soul, choose him and not you, in case I would and did choose thus, this you cannot prevent. No, you are right. I cannot prevent that. And so I have nothing to help me to resist. Here at home there is no single thing that attracts me and binds me. I am so absolutely rootless in your house, Vongo. The children are not mine. Their hearts, I mean, never have been. When I go, if I do go, either with him to-night or to Skjoldviken to-morrow, I haven't a key to give up, an order to give about anything whatsoever. I am absolutely rootless in your house. I have been absolutely outside everything from the very first. You yourself wished it. No. No, I did not. I neither wished it nor did not wish it. I simply left things just as I found them the day I came here. It is you and no one else who wished it. I thought to do all for the best for you. Yes, Wrangel, I know it so well. But there is retribution in that, a something that avenges itself. For now I find no binding power here, nothing to strengthen me, nothing to help me. Nothing to draw me towards what should have been the strongest possession of us both. I see it, Elida, and that is why from to-morrow you shall have back your freedom. Henceforth you shall live your own life. And you call that my own life? No. My own true life lost its bearings when I agreed to live with you. Clenches her hand in fear and unrest. And now, to-night... In half an hour he who I forsook is coming, he to whom I should have cleaved for ever, even as he has cleaved to me. Now he is coming to offer me, for the last and only time, the chance of living my life over again, of living my own true life, the life that terrifies and attracts. And I cannot forego that, not freely. That is why it is necessary your husband and your doctor should take the power of acting from you, and act on your behalf. Yes, Vongel, I quite understand. Believe me, there are times when I think it would be peace and deliverance if with all my soul I could be bound to you, and try to brave all that terrifies and attracts. But I cannot. No, no, I cannot do that. Come, Elida, let us walk up and down together for a while. 
I would gladly, but I dare not, for he said I was to wait for him here. Come, there is time enough. Do you think so? Plenty of time, I tell you. Then let us go for a little while. They pass out in the foreground right. At the same time, Arnholm and Bolette appear by the upper bank of the pond. Bolette noticing the two as they go out. See there. Hush, let them go. Can you understand what has been going on between them these last few days? Have you noticed anything? Have I not? Anything peculiar? Yes, one thing and another. Haven't you? Well, I don't exactly know. Yes, you have. Only you won't speak about it. I think it will do your stepmother good to go on this little journey. Do you think so? I should say it would be well for all parties that she should get away every now and then. If she does go home to Skjöldviken tomorrow, she will never come back here again. My dear Bolette, whatever makes you think that? I am quite convinced of it. Just you wait. You'll see that she'll not come back again. Not, anyhow, as long as I and Hilda are in the house here. Hilda, too? Well, it might perhaps be all right with Hilda, for she is scarcely more than a child. And I believe that at bottom she worships Alida. But you see, it's different with me. A stepmother who isn't so very much older than oneself. Dear Bolette, perhaps it might, after all, not be so very long before you left. Really? Have you spoken to father about it? Yes, I have. Well, what does he say? Hmm. Well, your father's so thoroughly taken up with other matters just now. Yes. Yes, that's how I knew it would be. But I got this much out of him. You mustn't reckon upon any help from him. No? He explained his circumstances to me clearly. He thought that such a thing was absolutely out of the question, impossible for him. And you had the heart to come and mock me? I've certainly not done that, dear Bolette. It depends wholly and solely upon yourself whether you go away or not. What depends upon me? Whether you are to go out into the world, learn all you most care for, take part in all you are hungering after here at home, live your life under brighter conditions, Bolette. Bolette, clasping her hands together. Good God! But it's impossible. If father neither can nor will, and I have no one else on earth to whom I could turn. Couldn't you make up your mind to accept a little help from your old, from your former teacher? From you, Mr. Arnholm? Would you be willing to— Stand by you? Yes, with all my heart, both with word and in deed. You may count upon it. Then you accept? Well, do you agree? Do I agree? To get away, to see the world, to learn something thoroughly. All that seemed to be a great, beautiful impossibility. All that may now become a reality to you, if only you yourself wish it. And to all this unspeakable happiness you will help me. Oh, no. Tell me, can I accept such an offer from a stranger? You can from me, Bolette. From me you can accept anything. Bolette, seizing his hands. Yes, I almost think I can. I don't know how it is, but— Oh, I could both laugh and cry for joy, for happiness. Then I should know life really after all. I began to be so afraid life would pass me by. You need not fear that, Bolette. But now you must tell me quite frankly if there is anything, anything that you are bound to here. Bound to? Nothing. Nothing, whatever? No, nothing at all. That is, I am bound to father to some extent, and to Hilda too. But— Well, you'll have to leave your father sooner or later. And sometime Hilde also will have to go her own way in life. That is only a question of time, nothing more. And so there is nothing else that binds you, Bolette? Not any kind of connection? Nothing whatever. As far as that goes, I could leave at any moment. Well, if that is so, dear Bolette, you shall go away with me. Bolette clapping her hand. Oh, God! What joy to think of it! For I hope you trust me fully. Indeed I do. And you dare to trust yourself and your future fully and confidently into my hands, Bolette? Is that true? You will dare to do this? Of course. How could I not do so? Could you believe anything else? You who have been my old teacher. My teacher in the old days, I mean. Not because of that. 
I will not consider that side of the matter. But, well, so you are free, Bolette. There is nothing that binds you, and so I ask you, if you could, if you could, bind yourself to me for life. Bolette steps back, frightened. What are you saying? For all your life, Bolette, will you be my wife? Bolette, half to herself. No, 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 that is impossible, utterly impossible. It is really so absolutely impossible for you to— But surely you cannot mean what you are saying, Mr. Arnholm. Looking at him. Or, yet, was that what you meant when you offered to do so much for me? You must listen to me one moment, Bolette. I suppose I have greatly surprised you. Oh, how could such a thing from you— how could it but but surprise me perhaps you are right of course you didn't you could not know it was for your sake that i made this journey did you come here for for my sake i did bolette in the spring i received a letter from your father and in it there was a passage that made me think hmm, that you held your former teacher in in a little more than friendly remembrance how could father write such a thing he did not mean it so but I worked myself into the belief that here was a young girl longing for me to come again. No, you mustn't interrupt me, dear Bolette. And, you see, when a man like myself, who is no longer quite young, has such a belief, or fancy, it makes an overwhelming impression. There grew within me a living, a grateful affection for you. I thought I must come to you, see you again, and tell you I had shared the feelings that I had fancied you had for me. And now you know it is not so, that it was a mistake. It can't be helped, Bolette. Your image, as I bear it within myself, will always be coloured and stamped with the impression that this mistake gave me. Perhaps you cannot understand this, but still it is so. I never thought such a thing possible. But now you have seen that it is possible. What do you say now, Bolette? Couldn't you make up your mind to be, yes, to be my wife? Oh, it seems so utterly impossible, Mr. Arnholm. You who have been my teacher. I can't imagine ever standing in any other relation towards you. Well, well, if you think you really cannot, then our old relations remain unchanged, dear Bolette. What do you mean? Of course, to keep my promise all the same, I will take care you get out into the world and see something of it. Learn some things you really want to know. Live safe and independent. Your future I shall provide for also, Bolette, for in me you will always have a good, faithful, trustworthy friend. Be sure of that. Good heavens! Mr. Arnholm, all that is so utterly impossible now. Is that impossible too? Surely you can see that, after what you have just said to me and after my answer. Oh, you yourself must see that it is impossible for me now to accept so very much from you. I can accept nothing from you, nothing after this. So you would rather stay at home here and let life pass you by? Oh, it is such dreadful misery to think of that. Will you renounce knowing something of the outer world? Renounce bearing your part in all you yourself say you are hungering for? To know there is so infinitely much, and yet never really to understand anything of it? Think carefully, Bolette. Yes. Yes, you are right, Mr. Arnholm. And then, when one day your father is no longer here, then perhaps to be left helpless and alone in the world, or live to give yourself to another man, whom you, perhaps, will also feel no affection for? Oh, yes, I see how true all you say is. But still, and yet, perhaps— Well? Bolette, looking at him hesitatingly. Perhaps it might not be so impossible after all. What, Bolette? Perhaps it might be possible— to accept what you propose to me. Do you mean that, after all, you might be willing to, that, at all events, you could give me the happiness of helping you as a steadfast friend? No, 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 never that, for that would be utterly impossible now. No, Mr. Arnholm, rather take me. Bolette, you will? Yes, I believe I will. And after all, you will be my wife? Yes, if you still think that, that you will have me. Think. Seizing her hand. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Bolette. All else that you have said, your former doubts, these do not frighten me. If I do not yet possess your whole heart, I shall know how to conquer it. 
oh bolette i shall wait upon you hand and foot and then i shall see something of the world shall live you have promised me that and will keep my promise and i may learn everything i want to i myself will be your teacher as formerly bolette do you remember the last school year to think to know oneself free and to get out into the strange world and then not to need to be anxious for the future not to be harassed about one's stupid livelihood no you will never need to waste a thought upon such matters and that's a good thing too in its way dear bolette isn't it eh indeed it is that is certain arnholm putting his arms around her oh you will see how comfortably and easily we shall settle down together and how well and safely and trustfully we two shall get on with one another bolette yes i also begin to i believe really it will answer looks out right and hurriedly frees herself oh don't say anything about this what is it dear oh it's that poor pointing see out there is it your father no it's the young sculptor he's down there with hilda oh lingstrom what's really the matter with him why you know how weak and delicate he is yes unless it's simply imaginary no it's real enough he'll not last long but perhaps that's best for him dear why should that be best because because nothing would come of his art anyhow let's go before they come gladly my dear bolette hilda and lingstrand appear by the pond hi hi won't your honours wait for us bolette and i would rather go on a little in advance he and bolette exit left <laughs> it's very delightful here now everybody goes about in pairs always two and two together hilda looking after them i could almost swear he's proposing to her really have you noticed anything yes it's not very difficult if you keep your eyes open but miss valetta won't have him I i'm certain of that no for she thinks he's got so dreadfully old-looking and she thinks he'll soon get bald it's not only because of that she'd not have him anyhow how can you know well because there's someone else she's promised to think of only to think of while he's away yes oh then i suppose it's you she's to think of perhaps it might be she promised you that yes think she promised me that but mind you don't tell her you know huh? oh i'll be mum i'm as secret as the grave i think it's awfully kind of her and when you come home again are you going to be engaged to her and then marry her no that wouldn't very well do for i daren't think of such a thing during the first years and when i shall be able to she'll be rather too old for me i fancy and yet you wish her to think of you yes she's so useful to me you see i'm an artist and she can very well do it because she herself has no real calling but all the same it's kind of her do you think you'll be able to get on more quickly with your work if you know that belletta is here thinking of you yes i fancy so to know there is a spot on earth where a young gentle reserved woman is quietly dreaming about you i fancy it must be so so well i really don't exactly know what to call it perhaps you mean fascinating fascinating oh yes fascinating was what i meant or something like it looks at her for a moment you're so clever miss hilda really you are very clever when i come home again you'll be about the same age as your sister is now perhaps too you'll look like your sister looks now and perhaps too you'll be of the same mind she is now then perhaps you'll be both yourself and your sister in one form so to say would you like that well, i i hardly know yeah well, yes i almost think i should but now for this summer i would rather you were like yourself alone and exactly as you are do you like me best as i am yes i like you immensely as you are hmm tell me you who are an artist do you think i'm right always to wear bright colored summer dresses yes yes i i think you're quite right you think bright colors suit me then 
they suit you charmingly to my taste but tell me as an artist how do you think i should look in black in black miss hilda yes all in black do you think i should look well black's hardly suitable for the summer however you'd probably look remarkably well in black especially with your appearance hilda looking straight in front of her all in black up to the throat black frilling round that black gloves and a long black veil hanging down behind if you were dressed so miss hilda i should wish i were a painter and i'd paint you as a young beautiful sorrowing widow or a young sorrowing betrothed girl yes that that would be better still but you can't wish to be dressed like that i hardly know but i think it's fascinating 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 to think of yes suddenly pointing left oh just look there lingstrand looking the great english steamer and right by the pier wangel and elida come in past the pond no i assure you dear elida you are mistaken seeing the others what are you two here it's not in sight yet is it mr lingstrand the great english ship yes lingstrand pointing there she is already doctor i knew it come come like a thief in the night as one might say so quietly and noiselessly you must go to the pier with hilda be quick i'm sure she wants to hear the music yes we were just going there doctor perhaps we'll follow you we'll come directly hilda whispering to lingstrand they're hunting in couples too hilda and lingstrand go out through the garden left music is heard in the distance out at the fjord during the following come he is here yes yes i feel it you'd better go in alida let me talk with him alone oh that's impossible impossible i say oh do you see him wangel the stranger enters from the left and remains on the pathway outside the fence the stranger bowing good evening you see i am here again alida yes yes the time has come now and are you ready to start or not you can see for yourself that she is not i am not asking about a travelling dress or anything of that kind nor about packed trunks all that is needed for a journey i have with me on board i've also secured a cabin for you to elida so i ask you if you are ready to go with me to go with me freely oh do not ask me do not tempt me a ship's bell is heard in the distance that is the first bell for going on board now you must say yes or no elida wringing her hands to decide decide for one's whole life never to be able to undo it again never in half an hour it will be too late elida looking shyly and searchingly at him why is it you hold to me so resolutely don't you feel as i do that we two belong together do you mean because of the vow vows bind no one neither man nor woman if i hold so steadfastly to you it is because i cannot do otherwise why didn't you come before elida oh all that attracts and tempts and lures into the unknown all the strength of the sea concentrated in this one thing the stranger climbs over the fence elida stepping back to wangel what is it what do you want i see it and i hear it in you elida after all you will choose me in the end wangel going towards him my wife has no choice here i am here both to choose for her and to defend her yes defend if you do not go away from here away from this land and never come back again do you know to what you are exposing yourself no no wangel not that what will you do to me i will have you arrested as a criminal at once before you go on board for i know all about the murder at skjoldviken oh wangel how can you i was prepared for that and so takes a revolver from his breast pocket i provided myself with this elida throwing herself in front of him no no do not kill him better kill me neither you nor him don't fear that this is for myself i will live and die a free man wangel let me tell you this tell it you so that he may hear it you can indeed keep me here 
you have the means and the power to do it. And you intend to do it. But my mind, all my thoughts, all the longings and desires of my soul, these you cannot bind. These will rush and press out into the unknown that I was created for, and that you have kept me from. I see it, Elida. Step by step you are slipping from me. The craving for the boundless, the infinite, the unattainable, will drive your soul into the darkness of night at last. Yes, I feel it hovering over me like black, noiseless wings. It shall not come to that. No other deliverance is possible for you. I at least can see no other. And so, so I cry off our bargain at once. Now you can choose your own path in perfect, perfect freedom. Elida stares at him a while, as if stricken dumb. Is it true? True, what do you say? Do you mean that? Mean it with all your heart? Yes, with all my sorrowing heart. I mean it. And can you do it? Can you let it be so? Yes, I can, because I love you so dearly. And have I come so near, so close to you? The years and the living together have done that. Elida clasping her hands together. And I, who so little understood this. Your thoughts went elsewhere, and now, now you are completely free of me and mine and and mine. Now your own true life may resume its real bent again, for now you can choose in freedom and on your own responsibility, Elida. Elida clasps her head with her hands and stares at Wangel. In freedom, and on my own responsibility. Responsibility, too. That changes everything. The ship bell rings again. Do you hear, Elida? It has rung now for the last time. Come. Elida turns towards him, looks firmly at him, and speaks in a resolute voice. I shall never go with you after this. You will not? Elida, clinging to Wangel. I shall never go away from you after this. Elida! Elida! So it is over? Yes. Over for all time. I see. There is something here stronger than my will. Your will has not a shadow of power over me any longer. To me you are as one dead who has come home from the sea, and who returns to it again. I no longer dread you, and I am no longer drawn to you. Good-bye, Mrs. Vongel. He swings himself over the fence. Henceforth you are nothing but a shipwreck in my life, that I have tied it over. He goes out left. Vongel looks at her for a while. Elida, your mind is like the sea. It has ebb and flow. Whence came the change? Oh, don't you understand that the change came, was bound to come when I could choose in freedom? And the unknown, it no longer lures you? Neither lures nor frightens me. I could have seen it, gone out into it, if only I myself had willed it. I could have chosen it. And that is why I could also renounce it. I begin to understand, little by little. You think and conceive in pictures, in visible figures. Your longing and aching for the sea, your attraction towards this strange man, these were the expression of an awakening and growing desire for freedom. Nothing else. I don't know about that. But you have been a good physician for me. You found and you dared to use the right remedy the only one that could help me. Yes, in utmost need and danger we doctors dare much. And now you are coming back to me again, Elida? Yes, dear, faithful Vongel. Now I am coming back to you again. Now I can, for now I come to you freely, and on my own responsibility. Vongel looks lovingly at her. Elida, Elida! to think that now we can live wholly for one another. And with common memories, yours as well as mine. Yes, indeed, dear. And for our children, Vongel. You call them ours. They who are not mine yet, 
but whom i shall win ours gladly and quickly kisses her hands i cannot speak my thanks for those words hilde ballestedt lingstrand arnholm and bolette come into the garden left at the same time a number of young townspeople and visitors pass along the footpath hilde aside to lingstrand see why she and father look exactly as if they were a betrothed couple ballestedt who has overheard it is summer time little missy arnholm looking at wangel and elida the english steamer is putting off bolette going to the fence you can see her best from here the last voyage this year soon all the sea highways will be closed as the poet says it is sad mrs wangel and now we are to lose you also for a time tomorrow you're off to schedule i hear no nothing will come of that we two have changed our minds to-night arnholm looking from one to the other oh really bolette coming forward father is that true hilde going towards elida are you going to stay with us after all yes dear hilda if you'll have me <laughs> fancy have you arnholm to elida but this is quite a surprise elida smiling earnestly well you see mr arnholm do you remember we talked about it yesterday when you have once become a land creature you can no longer find your way back again to the sea nor to the sea life either why that's exactly the case with my mermaid something like yes only with this difference that the mermaid dies of it it while human beings can accl acclimatize themselves yes yes i assure you mrs wangel they can accl acclimatize themselves in freedom they can mr ballestead and when they act on their own responsibility dear elida elida quickly holding out her hand to him exactly the great steamer glides noiselessly out beyond the fjord the music is heard nearer land End of Act Five. End of The Lady from the Sea by Henrik Ibsen. Translated by Eleanor Marks Aveling.